thank you because of the price you pay for our souls. Thank you because of the liberation you have given unto us. And we thank you because of the salvation we have received. Father, we bless and exalt you because of all the messages you have given unto us up to this hour. We are praying unto you, the Lord, as we go through this world. May your spirit come again and minister unto us in Jesus' name. Amen. May your power come upon our lives. Amen. Let there be a transformation, O God, a fulfillment of your word in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare, my Father, anywhere anybody is hearing my voice, let the power of the Holy Ghost go forth right there and touch the soul and convert and, co and transform in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, O oh Lord, this day. Because the devil has lost the battle. We have escaped and we can no longer be trapped. Father, thank you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Lord, and I pray unto you, anoint my lips. Give me your grace. Let your people hear your word. And let there be a change according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. By the grace of God, bro brothers and sisters, this time we are looking at the message, practical transformation of true converts in Christ. In Christ. Practical transformation of true converts in Christ. If you are hearing me, wherever you are, can you say it with me? One, two, go. Practical transformation of true converts in Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord by His grace has helped us. And I believe we have given our lives to Jesus Christ. I believe we have surrendered unto Him. But if there's anyone who up to this point has not done so, you still have another opportunity. And you want to make sure you grab this one because you don't know when the last one may come. And I pray that all of us, by God's grace, will make use of the opportunity that we presented unto us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And I want to tell us some of the scriptures we are going to read are familiar to us. And some of them we have already read them multiple times since this retreat started two days ago. And sometimes there may be a temptation. Well, I heard that before when we read that this morning. Well, that one is familiar. But I want to tell us something. When you have a message coming to you once, twice, thrice, that means God is confirming something unto you. That means God holds it very dear, very serious. And that means you need to take a very decisive action before it is too late. So the word of God is coming again unto us from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. Praise the Lord. That is the great apostle, Apostle Paul, who by the Holy Spirit was writing this letter unto the Corinthian brethren. And there was something that was of concern to the Holy Ghost. The Corinthian brethren, by the grace of God, we are so powerful and deal with the power of the Holy Ghost and deal with the gifts of the Holy Ghost. They were different when you compare them with other churches. But something was lacking in their midst, in their lives. They had all the doctrines, all the teachings, sitting under the anointing and the teaching of a man of God, great apostle Paul. Someone would expect that be someone like this coming to them, teaching them the word of God, that there will be nothing lacking in their midst when it comes to righteousness, when it comes to what it means to be truly converted. But unfortunately, it wasn't so for the Corinthian brethren. And so the Holy Ghost was writing unto them through Paul because the Holy Ghost loves them. And I'm going to tell you, the Holy Ghost loves you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus loves you. Amen. Amen. And out of the love of Jesus Christ, he didn't want the Corinthian brethren to just go on like that and live a lie and say, well, 
We are powerful. We are anointed. Our job is this. Our apostle is this. Our pastor is this. But he wanted them to know that they themselves needed something to be corrected in their lives. And so Apostle Paul, this three and dearly from the Holy Ghost, as he was writing this letter, he called them. He said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if any woman be in Christ, anybody who has surrendered his life, anybody who has answered all that all, if any man be in Christ, he said, that person is not the best kind of person that you want to see or you know before. That person is a new creature. All things are passed away. And I want to block off the call of attention to the wordings of that verse. You see, the way Paul is writing this, he put it in present tense. He said, if any man be in Christ, present, he is a new creator, present. All things are passed away, present. Behold, all things are become new. That means he's telling them, your salvation does not stop at the time you answer the call. Your repentance does not end at the time you raise up your hand and say, I surrender my life to Jesus. No, it did not end when you wait for water baptism. It did not end when you read the Bible in the morning or you came to church at whatever time. It did not end when you are saying they are in retreat, I give my life over unto you. He says it continues. Praise the Lord. And by the grace of God, you have been saved. Your salvation will continue in Jesus' day. So he says, all things are passed away, and all things are become new. What is he referring to here? He said there's going to be a transformation. Praise the Lord. There's going to be a transformation. What does that mean? There's going to be a change. And evidence that, yes, you have changed, you have given your life to Christ, that you are a saved man, a saved woman. There must be something that will go with you, that the world will know that this person is no longer the kind of person he used to be. There are going to be a difference between you and the people who have never answered that call. They may still be in the church, but they have not repented. They have not given their life to Christ like you say you did. And they may, or they may be in the world out there. They are still doing one thing or the other that when you know is wrong and says, you yourself, you are giving your life to Christ, there is going to be a change, and that is the transformation we are talking about today. What does it mean? It means a transformation, and we are not just talking about a transformation, we are talking about a practical transformation. Practical transformation. That means it's not just the saying that, well, I have given my life to Christ, I am born again. He said there must be something that will be seen, an action that will follow, a lifestyle that will follow, an attitude that will follow, something that will prove to the world that yet of a truth, you don't just say it with your mouth, but your life matches what your word says. That is the practical transformation, what we are looking at, and it says of true comfort in Christ. In other words, if you are truly saved, if you are truly saved, a true comfort, not hypocritical, a true comfort, not somebody who just comes to church because other people are going to church, you want to just be in the number, but you say you are truly saved, whether you are an old member or a new member, whether you are a minister or a member, no matter who you are, no matter your age, he says that if you are truly giving your life to Christ, it's going to be evident. There are going to be an evidence that will show that, yes, you have been saved. And by the grace of God, the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as like I said, a convincing, a practical transformation is a convincing proof of someone's salvation. A convincing proof of someone's salvation. Something that will prove convincingly, without any other of doubt, that you have been saved, that you have been converted. But it's a, a practical transformation that people will notice in that person's life. Not just the water baptism, water baptism is good, not just the service that we render in the church, all that is good, not just our church agenda, of course that is very, very important. You have to be in church services all the time. All those things are good, but I want to tell us something, even all believers, they do the same. Those who have not been saved, those who have not been converted, they do the same. Unfortunately, I may, may I say this, even the devil also goes to church. Yeah, we have a lot of witch doctors today that are in the church. 
Some of them are even on the pulpit as pastors, leading congregations. Thank God it is not in this place. Amen. Amen. I said, thank God it is not in this place. Amen. And it shall not come to our church in Jesus' name. Amen. But we have to understand that the practical transformation is very necessary. If we are going to prove to the world that we have been saved, and if God is going to be happy with us that we have been saved, we must prove it. And that is why a song says that this, something happened to me when I gave my life to Christ. Since I belong to, since I, since I love before, I hate them now. And since I hate them before, I love them now. And by the grace of God, that is what transformation means. And you are going to be transformed after the messages you have heard in this retreat in Jesus' name. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, from verse 11. The word of God here is telling us about what God is expecting of us as people who have been saved, people who have heard the word of God. He says in verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Remember, it always that of salvation. And it's continued in verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness. That's what the grace does. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss. We should do what? Same with me if you are there, one who go. We should live somebody righteously and godly in this present world. He says, live somebody righteously, godly in this present world. That means a Christian, as a believer, you have been converted. There is a mandate for you. Paul there is saying, he is not saying you may leave. He's not saying say that you should leave. That means it's a mandate. It is compulsory. It is mandatory. And so if any Christian does not leave according to the word of God written here, that person is going completely against the will of God. And of course, the salvation of that person is questionable. So you must know that you cannot live in worldly lust. You cannot live in ungodliness. You cannot live in, uh, and you cannot live carelessly the way you like. He said, looking for, for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us and he, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people serious of good works. May I ask you a question? And you be saved. The answer is going to be yes to some people, but the good next question is, are you denied unworthiness? Are you denied worthiness, rather? Are you denied ungodliness? Are there no traces of worthiness that people can find in you? When people look at you, can people truly say, there is nothing about this world that I will find in this person? Can people truly say, this person is completely godly in his thought, in his action, in, his, in everything that he does? Can that be said about you? If that is not so, then that means you, by God's grace, you have an opportunity this afternoon to make amends and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul is saying, let me take a step from verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. After you have been saved, after you have confessed that you are a child of God, after you have raised up your hand and said, I am born again, after you have gone to water baptism, after you have been admitted into the service of the Lord, he says, I he says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And what's the next thing? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. There can be no practical transformation. If somebody is not holy, 
In all that we do is sermon, singing, leading prayer, do what in all the other preaching, and then there is no holiness that the that even the world can attest to. That say this person is holy. Then that means our salvation, our transformation is also questionable. And therefore, Paul that step comes to verse two, and then tells of what we need to do. He says, "And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye that it renewed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable." And perfect will of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When you are saved, something is going to happen on the inside. Your line of thoughts are going to change. The way you have been thinking will change. Your perception of things will change. The importance you lay on some things are also going to change. And so it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I want to quickly go through some characters in the Bible. People like you, like me, who by the grace of God, in their own time, one point or the other, they met Christ and what happened unto them. And this is going to tell us that you and I also can do the same thing in Jesus' name. The Bible tells us of a man, King Saul. That's Samuel chapter 10, verses 9, verses 6, 9, and 10. The Bible there tells us about a man, King Saul. This man was made by the man of God. God was preparing him to be the next king, to be the king of Israel. And so, when the man of God met him, Elijah met him, he touched him, he anointed him, he instructed him, and immediately after that, the Bible says what Saul was going away, going back home. And then he met a company of prophets, just as instructed or just as revealed by the man of God. And as soon as Saul saw them, Saul himself began to prophesy. The Holy Ghost came on him, he began to prophesy. And there was a question people asked. They said, is Saul also among the prophets? What does that mean? What does that tell us? That tells us that when the last time they saw Saul, he was not anywhere near to be a prophet. He was not anywhere near to be anointed by the Holy Ghost. He was just an ordinary person. But now, the next day, they saw the same man they saw yesterday coming, and they will see him prophesying. They will see him speaking, and then they wonder, when did this happen to this man? And they said, he saw also among the prophets. May I ask you, my brother and my sister, the word of God has come unto you. Pastors of the pastors have ministered unto us. The, our GS has ministered unto us. See, that time till now, as the Holy Ghost, be able to have an inroad in your mind. As the Holy Ghost be able to influence your life. As the Holy Ghost be able to convince you that certain things need to be changed. And then you are down. That when you leave the retreat, people are going to ask, Oh, is that sister, is that girl also a born again? Is that brother also a born again? I pray that that question will be asked of you in Jesus' name. Amen. But that will only be asked when there is an evidence in your life. And do not proceed. Jacob. Jacob in Genesis chapter 35. The Bible tells us in chapter 32, Jacob made an angel and was praying and was aggressively fighting and then go down all the way to chapter 35. God spoke unto Jacob in verse 1 and said, go back now to Bethel. Go back to Bethel. And then Jacob gathered all his family, his children and his wives, and told them and said, we are now going to go back to Bethel. Therefore, take away all the gods that are in your hand. Take away all the gods. He did not mention any particular thing unto them. And the Bible tells us somehow that these people, they knew exactly what the gods 
This man was talking about Genesis chapter 35, reading from verse 1. And God said, and these people, they began to rip off all the earrings and all the golds and all the bangles and everything that were in their hands and in their ears. Let I'm reading from verse Reading from verse 2, then Jacob said unto his household and to all that we are with him, put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change what? Your garments. Change your garments. And say, and let us arise and go to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. In our own time today, it means Christianity. It means salvation. Let us now go. And the Bible tells us that. And they gave unto Jacob, verse 4, all the strange gods which were in their what? Hands, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the hole which was by shaken. And the journey and the terror of God was upon the cities that were around about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. This tells us transformation, practical transformation. That when you have saved, when you say that you have been saved, it's not just that you say in your mouth, not just that you get all oh, well, salvation or oh, holy is in the heart, it has to be seen on you. Jacob here is giving us an example. When we say we have been saved, there are certain things physically that we have to go away from us. Here, some people will argue. But somehow you discover that the family of Jacob did not even argue with him. They don't tell us why we have to take this all before we can join in with you. The moment he told them, they, they, they willingly surrendered everything and he buried them. May I tell you, those gods in your ears, those gods in your, in, in your hands, those perforated clothes, all those Babylonian garments, those straight garments, those apparel that you used to wear before you gave your life to Christ, and you are still holding on to them. You don't wear them when you come to a church. But after service, if they see you somewhere, sometimes we, are, we hardly recognize you that you are the same sister or you are the same brother that was in church the other day. Because those things, those, when you come to service, you put them away. But they are hidden in your drawers. You don't, you, you, you don't use them, but they are there. That is not practical transformation. Practical transformation means you bury them, you destroy them, you completely get rid of them. That's the example that Jacob said, uh, put down for us here. And we have to mention these things because the Bible was written for our example. And I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you see how some clothing, maybe you are a brother. Because there are brothers today that they dress also like this way. Uh, GF was speaking to us uh, later, uh, earlier and said, Some brothers, you supposed to see them with earrings, they call themselves brothers, so let us you, you call them brothers. That's what they call themselves. They see them with all the earrings and everything, and the way they dress themselves, you see, uh, in this person say, and say, Well, I play piano, I play keyboard, I'm a drummer, I'm a choir leader, I'm this, I'm that. Thank God. I pray that God will save their souls in Jesus' name. Another person is Elisha. Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 9. Elisha. Bible says, A woman met him, met him. I was observing this man day by day, day by day. And then he came to a conclusion about Elisha and said, for this is a holy man of God. Can that be said about you? My pastors, we are asked this question humbly. Thank God for all the messages that we preach. Thank God for all the things that we say. Thank God for all the teachings. But after the service, after the church service, and our hopes, can it be said? Of a truth, this man is a holy man of God. When we go to work, can it be said of us? Can the unbelievers there who have been watching us, who have been monitoring us, who have been looking at the way we do things, at the way we talk, and the way we act, and the way we interact, can they come to the conclusion of a truth? I, I, I may 
may not be great on the top of this man, but this man is a holy man of God. Can that be said? And women need not be asked the same question. We are dealing with church members. Can your church member, the sister, be able to say, when you are not there, they are talking about you? Can they come to the conclusion that lady, that woman, that pastor's wife is a holy woman of God? Or is there something that is questionable? That though before you they are so humble, they are so because they are really scared of you. That if they say this, oh, our hair will lose. And so they keep quiet. They put on the aid, they endure it. But behind you, they are saying, I'm not sure our pastor's wife is saved. I'm not sure our pastor's wife is born again. Is that said about you? Cannot be said about you. When you come to church, you dress like a very beautiful angel. But after, after the church, the church members, they see you. And sometimes they are wondering, our pastor's wife is dressing this way. Why can't we dress the same way? Our pastor's wife is act, acting this way. Why can't we act the same way? Our pastor's wife are talking this way. Why can't we talk the same way? Is that, said, is, is that what the people say about you? If that is the same, then today we need to understand the comment that needs to be said about us is that of the truth, this is a holy man of God, this is a holy woman of God. It is when we have come to that point that it can be said, yes, we are practically transformed. And we shall be transformed in Jesus' day. That's another person now coming to the New Testament. The Samaritan woman is a known story, well known story. This woman was a woman that the story about her background, she was promiscuous. She was jumping from one man to the other. She has already married five different husbands. When she met Jesus Christ as well, and then Jesus Christ was talking with her, and Jesus asked her, go and call your husband. He said, no, I don't have any husband. Jesus Christ said, of course, you are saying the truth. You don't have a husband, but you are married five, and the one that you have right now is not even your husband, meaning that she was already living with number six man. But you know what happened to this woman? The moment she was convinced and converted by Christ, she ran into the city. And then a woman that the entire community knew her before, she went to the world as a woman that was jumping from one man to the other. The next time they saw her a few hours later, they saw her running and screaming and publicizing and shouting, I come and see, come and see, it is not the Messiah. In other words, immediately she turned from Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Something happened. Let's find out what is happening. They are calling me. As we are getting that fixed, thank God for us who are here. The resurrection power do something in my life. Today, today, do something in my life. The resurrection power, do something in my life. Today, today, do something in my life. The resurrection power. Stop, please go ahead. Pastor. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I was talking about the Samaritan woman. So this woman left her water pot, ran into the city, and immediately began to prophesy Jesus Christ. He was announcing to the people, come and see, come and see. And I believe there are people that knew her before we are wondering what has come upon this woman. This woman that we know does not even go to church. This woman that we know does not have a Bible. 
This one that, that we know has not even met the Messiah. What does she have to do with the Messiah? That the woman was immediately preaching and publicizing. In other words, when she met Christ, there was this practical transformation that took place that immediately turned her from a promiscuous woman to a preacher. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that is what is expected of anybody who are going to be saved, going to be converted. You are going to be able to forget about your past and immediately become a preacher, a publisher of the word of God. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Yes. Zacchaeus is another man I want, to, I want us to look at. An example. Remember, I told us we to look at these men and women of God in the Bible. When I talk about practical transformation, what happened to them when they met Christ? And you as a believer, I as a believer, we need to look at them. If God will do that in their lives, if they could be transformed that way, you and I can do the same in Jesus' name. Zacchaeus, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, the Bible says, Zacchaeus, Chapter 19, rather, Luke chapter 19, and reading from verse 2. Luke 19, verse 2. Zacchaeus, a man, a froster, fraudulent person, met Jesus Christ. God's converted by Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us people began to murmur because they were still looking at him. Through the eyes of his past, through the lights of his past, and they were wondering, they were wondering, murmuring, what does the matter have to do with a man like this? And Zacchaeus, hearing what the people were saying about him, knowing that of course they were right, because his past was very, very fraudulent, his past was evil, he was a wicked person. Somebody that would just take this up from the hands of other people. And Zacchaeus right there in order for him to prove the world and prove to Christ that he has been converted, truly converted, that he means what he, what he, what he has decided to do. The Bible says Zacchaeus right there declared unto Christ that he has taken anything, anything from anybody and going to restore unto him for folks. What does that mean? Restitution. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Some of us, thank God, we, we are born again. We bet we are born again. But the certificate we are using right now is not the certificate that actually you work for. A forged certificate. Some of us, we are doing a job. And that job, what we wrote on our application is false. And yet we are getting money from that job. Some of us, something that we stole before we gave our life to Christ, we are still using them. And then we say, well, I pray God has forgiven me. No. Zacchaeus show us an example. When you are truly saved, there are going to be this practical transformation that will be saved in you. And that is, there must be an immediate restitution of anything that we have not take, taken from anybody without the consent of that person. Anything that you stole, you do by deceit, you must forsake, you must restore. That is the example. And so are you listening to all the messages of restitution that we have been listening? There is something in your heart as I'm speaking right now. Something is telling you, you remember a particular thing, something that you said, maybe a lie that you told, and then something has been telling you, the Holy Ghost has been hitting your heart, Go and make restitution. But you say, well, I pray God has forgiven me. If God has forgiven me, the Holy God is still reminding you. Holy God cannot conflict with God. Today, by the grace of God, they are going to demonstrate that of the truth you mean what you mean. What you have said that you are a child of God. Go and make restitution. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you the danger of not making restitution when we need to. Help them with, with both your blessings. Until you are giving out away what does not belong to you. There are many people that they are not going to make heaven. After preaching, after singing, after confessing, after the water baptism, I 
after the big name that we carry, they will still not make heaven. Why? Because they are still something in their possession. And there are people, let me say this, there are people that they know how to hide things. Husband and wife. Let me talk to us a little bit. You have been married. You understand the Bible says, and the two shall become one flesh. When you are doing something secretly, your spouse does not know about it. Some people who are Africans, they send money, it could be the husband, it could be the wife, whoever. They send money to Africa and they are having a project. They are having maybe a house, maybe a business, maybe be something else without the knowledge, not even the consent of the other partner. And then they, are, they find a way to hide the information. The wife will not allow the husband to see the text message, the phone call, the email. Because it contains something that she has been hiding from the husband. It could be the husband hiding information. And so anytime the wife comes close to the phone, the husband immediately finds a way to take the phone and delete some messages. Let me tell us something. You may delete a message you don't want somebody to see. But if that message is something that is against the will of God, you have not deleted the copy that is in heaven. How will see hold that copy of that email, the copy of that text message? You've only deceived a human being, but God has not been deceived. Someday is coming, God is going to pray before you. God is going to present to you. This is so day like this, this is what I've been reading. Oh, but I thought I have not. No, it was not deleted from, the, from heaven's fire. It's still there in heaven's folder. Today, by the grace of God, you will make a man in Jesus' name. Amen. I said you will make a man in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Not a few examples, but I want to close with this. Look at those, those are good examples. But then there was the another example. Example of men. Um, they were in the church. But yet they were not transformed. They joined the fold. They also said, I have given my life to Christ. And they, are, they were occupied prominent positions, some of them, but yet they were not transformed. Are you like that? Look at somebody like uh, Geotrephus in 3 John verse 9. 3 John verse 9. Geotrephus was a member of the church, occupied a big position. But Apostle John wrote to the church and said, When I come, why? Because they will go and duty will not allow us. Even the people that we want and to accept us, duty will was standing against them. Are you like that in the church? You are here in the church and you are opposing your leader. You are fighting your pastor. You are gossiping against your leader. Sometimes the way we do it these days, we do it very craftily because we don't want you to see that we are not born again. So behind the pastor, when we are not in our different homes, between us in our family, we now discuss the pastor negatively among ourselves in the family. Is that what you do? Then you are not different from your treatments. And I pray that you will not be like that in Jesus' name. Another man called Simon the Sorcerer. Simon, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. This man in Samaria was a prominent man. Very dynamic. People were going to him for sorcery, a witch doctor. And then Philip came to that city. And Philip was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. People's lives were transformed. And people were beginning to burn their magical books. Practical transformation. And then Philip and Simon himself, the Bible tells us, and Simon also believed. I want to look at that. And Simon also believed, verse 13. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 13. I want to just read that because I'm concluding with this story. And I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Simon also believed in verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. I 
And when he was baptized, you see that he believed the preaching of Philip. And he was also baptized, just like any other born again Christian rule. And then, and the Bible says further in verse 14. Let, let's look at it, verse 15. Okay, let me just step down to verse 18. And when Simon saw, it was when Peter came to the city. And when Simon saw that through nailing on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. That was another man, Simon the Sorcerer. He was also in the church. Born again in quote, saved by God's grace in quote. But this man, unfortunately, was not transformed. There was nothing to show in his action, in his quest, that he has been transformed. And the Bible says when he saw the Holy Ghost moving through Apostle Peter, he offered him money. And that's the problem with some people today. Some people are so enticed by power. So drunken with power. Everything that we want to do is about the power of the Holy Ghost, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Don't misunderstand me. Anointing is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We all need the anointing. And we all are going to get the anointing. Amen. Amen. The anointing is not the best thing the Christian can have. Godly attitude is better. Praise the Lord. Anointing, let me say that again, anointing is good, but godly attitude is better. Why do I say so? Anointing only attracts men, the praises of men. Anointing does not attract God because if, if the anointing is really from God, God is the one that gives it. So God is not attracted by what he gave. It is men that are attracted by your anointing, by my anointing, by the anointing. So men will praise us, men will drop us, men will drop unto us, men will sing our praises, men will say all oh, good things about us, how dynamic, how powerful we are. But if there's no godly attitude, then all the anointing is in vain. And that's what Simon was missing here. He thought that by anointing a Lord, he was all right. He was not looking for a godly attitude. May I ask you, what most important prayer point? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much. We want to give you all the glory. Thank you for this hour, for this moment. Thank you because of what you have ministered unto us, the examples and the scriptures that you have given unto us. People that were men like us, women like us, who met you and their lives changed. And the testimony went about them that of the truth they were holy women and men of God. I pray that God will help us, that we also in this generation shall be the same in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.